For a lot of you, a Blue Jay with goggles makes this kind of a done deal. I mean, I get it. Just look at her character design, which is a great layer to Dirty Rascal Games' debut, Survival of the Fattest, but ultimately a meaningless layer if there weren't a solid foundation within. A deck building game played over 12 rounds, separated into three different seasons, each player takes on the role of a different forest critter, or in the case of my dudes Honey and Buns, critters. On your turn, you move your figure to a different one of the six different locations on the board than perform the associated action. Unlike everything worker placement games have taught you, there is no restriction on traveling to vacant locations. Your pawn is purely to mark where you've been, so no taking back-to-back -back turns at the market, and also adding a slight friction among players in the three forage spots, which are effectively the same thing, but some critters benefit from foraging alone or with others. All of this is in service is to acquire food cards, which go into your deck, then as your deck refreshes due to running out of cards to draw, which I might point out, your deck is initially made up of mostly forage cards used to acquire more food and a surprisingly potent and very welcome set of three unique cards for each critter, the food cards will flow into your hand, which you will then take a stash action to, surprise, surprise, put them into your stash, which can be used to fulfill delicious forest critter recipes acquired at the beginning of each season or procured from the market during season cleanup. And at the end of fall, the player who has acquired the most points from completed recipes and fed their critter once during the game, which is also accomplished with stashed food used during a season cleanup, which then upgrades your critter's inert bonus power to a significantly more powerful side, wins the game. Points don't mean a thing if you don't feed that thing or something like that. And that's the game. Okay, so now we got a concept of the game and it's time to talk about what I actually liked about it. And y'all, the asymmetry, even though this is a relatively light game and the asymmetry itself is relatively light in only three of the starting cards that you have in your deck and the character power that you have that's upgradable, it's still palpable and well-realized and thematically resonant. Like, it works for me that these characters have distinct personalities which inform what the character capabilities are, and having those unique powers do shape into different strategic possibilities in the game for what little levels of intersection there are, which is really cool. And speaking of the thematic resonance, I think the theme and presentation is so well done here. I mean, clearly the illustration illustrations are awesome, the, the character designs are great, and the overall woodland forest critter making recipes in order to get their chonk thing on is well realized. I like the theme of the game and it bakes it well into this overall concept and loop. And that loop, I really like the loop, like the, the overall thing that you're doing of fulfilling recipes by grabbing them, foraging for all the different foods, maybe exchanging some foods, and then putting those into your stash all before time runs out at the end of the season, and then making sure that what you had in your stash is allocated to the different recipes and busting those out. That all feels really good. There is a timing element and a rhythm and a sort of clockworkian aspect to this game that's relatively easy to get in sync with, but nonetheless feels good once you manage to do so. There's a lot of great luck mitigation that you do in this game with the drafting of cards and the ability to discard two cards to draw one at the start of your turn. And I weirdly like that one-time payment that you have to do in order to feed your critter before the end of the game to have any sort of consideration in the actual victory proposition. I find it charming. And the fact that if you do it earlier, you get access to a better ability for your critter that is going to last for more of the game is weird and wonky and interesting and makes this somewhat divergent from other games of its type. And speaking of unique abilities, I do like the fact that recipes can grant you unique abilities if you access them directly from the market, but 
that also straddles the line into some of the things that I don't really like about the game. So let's move over to some of those. While I do overall like this game, I think that it strives to do a little too much for its level of simplicity and the scope of the game. And that makes it uh, feel a little bit too loose and a little out of focus. Those recipes that are bought directly out of the market give you one time or ongoing or end game abilities, which sound like something that you want to access and routinely manipulate and play with, but with only one action per turn and not being able to go to the same location that you did in the last round, that is a lot harder to pull off than it sounds. I wish that you could just pay for recipes and that they would have ongoing bonuses for you and you were just limited in which ones you're actually keeping in those slots. And then foraging at the three different locations, which are effectively the same location, just in creating different uh, divisions for the different creatures. So that way you could have some creatures who want to be together and some are apart and you're drawing into the same cards and then when you're together, if you tie in the number of forge cards that you play, that it's broken by creature size. And other things like only being able to look at your stash at the end of a season, like those, those are my cards. I get it that you wanna create this level of suspense of did I actually allocate what I needed for paying for all my recipes, but I mean, do we really need that? It, it just feels like it's trying to get to a level of granularity that the rest of the tone and scope of the game doesn't really support. And then even though I do really like the rhythm of the game in the sense that you get the recipes, you get the food, you put them in your stash, you make sure you have it for the end of the season, end of the season, you pay for it, and then you repeat that uh, two more times, it, it feels like the worker placement aspect of the game and that sort of action selection system System is more like an arbitrary obstacle rather than compelling design. I would have loved a little bit more interesting locations to go to that give you compelling reasons why you want to go to those locations other than you just feel restricted like you have to. I see what they're going for, but I think in some ways these mechanics are in contention with the core fun of the game, which should be swift deck building to acquire goods, fulfill recipes, snag bonuses, employ unique powers, and have forest friendly fun. But the truth is, is that this game already does that relatively well. Survival of the Fattest is accessible, fresh, beautifully rendered, and fun. And my hope is that with further iteration before final release, it gets even better. And that is our review. But let us know in the comments below from Survival of the Fattest to Root to every game in between. What are some of your favorite games where you are playing as forest critters? I want to hear all about it because I'm a Red Wallian type of guy and just love hearing about the paw and claw setting. Though this isn't exactly paw and claw. But let us know either way. And as always, thanks for watching, thanks for supporting, thanks for being an awesome community. You know that I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.